Good evening and welcome to our evening prayer as we gather today on this Friday, Friday the 30th day of October. I'm Jim Gary, an honorary associate at the Church of the Ascension in London, Ontario. I had begun this recording outside. It was a little cool, but not bad. And just a couple of minutes into it, it started putting down some heavy, pretty heavy snow. And as I glance out now that I'm safely inside, the sun's come out. Well, we'll uh, probably get outside sometime next week. It's to be some warm days again. We've got a lot to talk about today uh, before we get into our prayers. Uh, today has been set aside by the church to honor and commemorate two precursors to the Reformation of the 16th century. First of all, we want to honor John Wycliffe, a 14th century English priest. He was educated with a doctorate from Oxford. He served a parish, parish in Lutterworth, and he started to criticize some of his fellow clergy as being unworthy of their office. And he thought that the powers that be might be able to somehow exclude them from holding uh, the clerical office. He also was challenging the church's doctrine on Christ's presence in the Eucharist, but he was able to avoid a trial for heresy. He was also involved and gave approval for a project to, uh, to translate the Bible into Middle English. Anyhow, John Wycliffe died of natural causes in 1384, having suffered a stroke while attending Mass. Today, we also want to remember another precursor of the Reformation era, Jan Hus, a Czech priest who was unjustly condemned, executed, and burned at the stake in 1415 because he was advocating reforms in the life and doctrine of the church. Protestants have always regarded Jan Hus as a precursor of their own movement because he was killed for advocating uh, reforms in doctrine and various changes in institutional abuses that he had seen, similar abuses to those that were identified by the 16th century reformers. In this century, I should note that Roman Catholic scholars have acknowledged that he was unjustly condemned and have recognized him as a teacher of great courage and true reforming instincts. On this day in history in 1873, P.T. Barnum's Circus, the greatest show on earth, debuted in New York City. In 1938, a radio broadcast of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds was narrated by Orson Welles as a little Halloween, Halloween prank, and it caused mass panic. Dance music on the Columbia Broadcasting System radio network was interrupted by an announcer who reported that a Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory had detected explosions on the planet Mars. The music came back for a little while, and then came another announcement that at 8.15 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, has fe had fell on a farm in Grover's Mills, New Jersey. And then it continued as an announcer was on scene, and the hatch of this object opened up, and a strange creature came out, and before long, uh, New Jersey state, state troopers had been burned, and before long then, a uh, mass uh, uh, panic ensued as it got worse and worse. I've listened to the recordings of this broadcast many times, and I always find it amazingly scary what they were able to do in 1938 with very minimal technical effects. My father has told me that he heard the program as it was actually being broadcast, and in his words, he thought he was done for. Uh, you can find this broadcast on YouTube. Simply look for War of the Worlds radio broadcast. There are many uh, versions of it there. It's about an hour in length. I think you might find it good Halloween season listening. On a little more, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, educational side, in 1944, Aaron Copeland's ballet score, Appalachian Spring, premiered in Washington, D.C. Uh, you may recognize the, the music Simple Gifts from it, which the church uses as Lord of the Dance. In 1945, on this date, Anne Frank was deported from Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp 
and was housed there in freezing conditions in makeshift tent housing. Uh, likely she died when a typhus epidemic swept through the camp in February of 1945, killing some 17,000 uh, prisoners. Uh, there is a memorial at Bergen-Belsen for Anne and her elder sister, Margot. I've uh, had occasion to visit Bergen-Belsen, and I will say it was a deeply moving visit, and I certainly mourn such a tragic loss of life. Also in 1952, on this date, Clarence Birdseye sold his first frozen peas. I think that's enough history for now. It's time for us to turn to our evening prayer. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Behold now, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you that stand by night in the house of the Lord. Bless the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place, and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you out of Zion. Our psalm is Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands to fight and my fingers to battle, my help and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I trust, who subdues the peoples under me. O Lord, what are we that you should care for us, mere mortals that you should think of us? We are like a puff of wind, our days like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Hurl the lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the great waters, from the hand of foreign peoples whose mouths speak deceitfully, and whose right hand is raised in falsehood. O God, I will sing to you a new song. I will play to you on a ten-stringed lyre. You give victory to kings and have rescued David, your servant. Rescue me from the hurtful sword and deliver me from the hand of foreign peoples, whose mouths speak deceitfully, and whose right hand is raised in falsehood. May our sons be like plants well nourished from their youth, and our daughters like sculptured corners of a palace. May our barns be filled to overflowing with all manner of crops. May the flocks in the pastures increase by thousands and tens of thousands. May our cattle be fat and sleek. May there be no breaching of the walls, no going into exile, no wailing in public squares. Happy are the people of whom this is so. Happy are the people whose God is a Lord. And we pray, generous and bountiful God, give compassion to the prosperous and comfort to the needy, that all people may come to love and praise you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn now to Holy Scripture. We are continuing our reading from the, e, uh, the epistle, the letter to uh, 1 Timothy, and we tonight we'll be reading verses from chapter 5. Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as to a father, to younger men as brothers, to older women as mothers, to younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. Honor widows who are really widows. If a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn their religious duty to their own family and make some repayment to their parents, for this is pleasing in God's sight. The real widow, left alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But the widow, who lives for pleasure, is dead even while she lives. Give these commands as well, so that they may be above reproach. And whoever does not provide for relatives, and especially for family members, 
has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be put on the list if she is If she is not less than 60 years old and has been married only once, she may, must be well attested to for her good works as one who has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to doing good in every way, but refused to put younger widows on the list, for when their sensual desires alienate them from Christ, they want to marry." and so they incur condemnation for having violated their first pledge. Besides that, they learn to be idle, gadding about from house to house, and they are not merely idle, but are also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not say. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and manage their households, so as to give the adversary no occasion to revile us. But some have already turned away to follow Satan." If any believing woman has relatives who are really widows, let her assist them. Let the church not be burdened so that it can assist those who are real widows. And this ends our reading. What was the situation with widows in first century Ephesus? Why does a letter writer need to go in such detail to Timothy on how to deal with widows. I think we need to know a few things about first century Greece. The, the sits in Leben, to use a German word, the milieu, to use a French word, in which the young church in Ephesus found itself. First, it was customary in Greece that girls would be married off soon after reaching puberty. 14 years of age or so, maybe 15, and they would often marry men who were 15 years or more their senior. And so as it happened, many women were left widowed. Some, in fact, were left widowed fairly young. This is not that unusual, even up until the time of the 19th and 20th century. My own maternal grandmother, whom we remembered on October 25th, the 125th anniversary of her birth, uh, was married when she was just 16 years of age. Uh, she married a man nearly 15 years her senior, and she was widowed at age 38 when my maternal grandfather died of a major paralytic stroke. Uh, it's, uh, I also had a cousin who was married at 15 years of age by court order to a somewhat older man because she was found in the biblical language to be with child. And my uncle uh, shook up a judge enough that he would order it to be done. Uh, and so there were a lot of widows. Simply stated, there were more widows than this young and struggling church in Ephesus could handle and deal with more than they were able to support. And so the letter writer has had to provide for Timothy some triage methods, to use a more modern term, some triage methods of sorting out all these widows. And so one had to be a real widow, 60 years of age or older, which in that time was a very ripe old age, and with no family to possibly support her perhaps a widow who had died childless, and also had to be a widow who had served the church in many ways. Now, I think it's fair to say that in our more modern times, the church is very dependent upon widows. In every church that I have served during my many years of the ministry, the widows are frequently the ones who are in the sewing and quilt making guilds. The widows often teach Sunday school. They visit other people within the church. Uh, they are the ones that can be counted upon to prepare meals and ever so much more. Not to say that others don't do it, but it's been my experience that widows serve the church well beyond their means and ability. So we honor those who are widowed 
and who work so hard and who serve in the church. As I said, every parish I have been in has dependent, been dependent upon those widows. And it's also important that the church recognize widows for the great service that they extend. In the parish I served in Sault Ste. Marie, one of the interns who had been there just a few years before I was there had recognized a large number of widows in the church. And she had set up a women's group just for them. And their official title was something like the Older Women's Group, but they called themselves the Rowdy Old Ladies. And they were a delightful group. And I was always invited to attend their gatherings and whatever in intern we had at the time was also invited. And their only business at any given meeting was to decide when and where they would meet next sometimes in one another's homes, sometimes going as a group to restaurants. They were the most delightful uh, group imaginable. And they got together, they drank large quantities of wine, they told jokes, I think often wanting to see if they could make me blush. But they were an amazing gift to me and to the whole church community. And I remember them with great pleasure and great fondness. I've also been pleased to serve several churches that recognized a number of older people in the church, predominantly widowed women, but some men also, and provided on a regular basis, uh, almost monthly, uh, worship, seniors worship services, followed by a nice hot dinner served, an opportunity to get together for worship, it was a shortened service, just about a half an hour in length. People were encouraged to sit for the whole service, so there was no getting up and down. And it was just a good time to be had together with a meal honoring whatever the season might be. So a Thanksgiving meal, a Christmas meal, a, uh, uh, a Valentine's meal, a Lenten meal, an Easter meal. You, you get the picture. Just an excellent time to be together. And I also cherish those gatherings and uh, the time I could spend with, uh, with some of these wonderful, wonderful older people of the church. So what has been written by this letter writer to Timothy may seem confusing, but the person has had a heart for caring for the older members of the church. And, and that includes everybody, because remember how it opened with words to... Uh, to look after the older ones. Uh, let me turn back so I, I read those again. Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as a father, to younger men as brothers, to older women as mothers, and to younger women as sisters with absolute purity. It's, uh, I've reached an age where I have become sensitive to ageist humor, and when I see it, on Facebook, I point it out as being ageist humor. Uh, I, I think that it has always been important that the church respect its elders. And as I approach that category myself, but I do not wish to be called elderly, uh, as I approach that category myself, I do respect, do appreciate respect when given. And I uh, do uh, feel that we should be together as sisters and brothers in the faith, honoring those older than ourselves and respecting also those younger than ourselves. Tomorrow we'll go into the rest of, uh, of this chapter, chapter five, and we will see that there is much here to deal with elders in general. Uh, this is a, an interesting letter, as I've said several times, and I'm very happy that we can open it up and see in spite of some difficulties here and there, when we uh, bridge the gap of 20 centuries and see the things in this letter written for the time in which they were written, we realize that there is still much good instruction for us in our time, in our place. And now I think we should be returning to our prayers. And first, prayers as we honor uh, both John Wycliffe and Jan Huss. O oh God, whose justice continually challenges your church to live according to its calling, grant us who now remember the work of John Wycliffe, so to forsake all anger and self-will, 
that the pure light of your gospel may continually cleanse and renew the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Eternal God, you endued your servant Jan Hus with singular gifts in character and utterance, so that he recalled the church to the image and form of Christ. Grant that we who honor him this day may ever obey the precepts of love, even as we bear witness against corruption, and may never cease to pray for our enemies, even as we suffer their contempt. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the prayer of this week. Lord God, our Redeemer, who heard the cry of your people and sent your servant Moses to lead them out of slavery, free us from the tyranny of sin and death, and by the leading of your Spirit, bring us to our promised land, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And I'm going to invite you now, in a time of silence, to offer the prayers, petitions, intercessions, and thanksgivings of your heart. And now in whatever language and form you choose, I invite you to join me in that model prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you today and always. Amen. Go in peace. May the God of peace go with you. Amen.